I'm here today with David Morris. David's new book is titled Lost Faith and Wandering Souls, a, a Psychology of Disillusionment, Mourning, and the Return of Hope. David is a PhD from Drew University, is a lifelong student of psychology and religion. There's the new book. Um, he served professionally for major national publishing brands, including Zondervan and Guideposts, and worked with best-selling authors and books. He's the publisher of Lake Drive Books and a literary agent at Hyponymous Consulting, two innovative ventures working together to specialize in authors and books that help people heal, grow, and discover. He lives with his wife in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and they have two daughters. You can learn more at davidrmorris.me. That's D-A-V-I-D-R-M-O-R-R-I-S dot M-E. So, David, thanks so much for joining us, and um, congratulations on all of your wonderful work. Oh, thank you. Great to be here. I'm a work in progress, like we all are. That's absolutely the case that we all are. <laughs> At least I hope I still am. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, it's great to be here. Thanks for the work that you do, and um, there's there's so much that um, everything you do, Brian, that offer that you're offering to writers and thinkers and spiritual folk of all kinds. So it's awesome. Well, thank you. I, mean, I appreciate that, and you know, just try to do my best to make a little difference, a little positive change in the world. So, yeah. Um, but anyway, I want to talk about you. Um, but yeah. Before we get into your books and your new businesses, could you tell people about your background? Because you know, you just got an outstanding track record there. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, I I uh, I grew up a preacher's kid, kind of in an evangelical background. Uh, moved around a lot, actually, and um, I think that kind of shaped who I am some. Um, I wound up studying psychology in college, and um, I couldn't get away from religion. <laughs> it's just part of my DNA, and so um, I went to grad school, and I studied psychology and religion together. Um, I didn't necessarily want to go into ministry. Um, I wanted to be more of a counselor who had a real strong sense of the spiritual side of life. Um, but I just got the bug for studying on, on a pretty high level of um, basically religious studies, like understanding the religious life from a psychological point of view. Um, but it was, a, it was a pretty esoteric degree. There's not a lot of academic positions in psych and religion. You either have to be sort of a psychologist who's interested in it, like a clinician or a research-based psychologist, or you have to be in pastoral psychology, like a, like a minister and in the ministry. Um, so I got involved in publishing, sort of to pay the bills as a grad student way back in the 90s. And, uh, um, you know, that just kind of got, got the bug. So and it's a bit of an adjacent, you know, field in a way. If I can keep working with authors and content having to do with faith and spirituality, um, that seemed to make sense. And uh, I ended up, my first, my first sort of bigger job in publishing was at Guidepost Magazine. Um, right, working right in the middle of Manhattan. I walked by the Empire State Building every day on my way into work. You're in New Jersey. You know what that's, sure. you know what the trains are like there. I took the yes, train every day. Yes. Um, yeah, so, uh, uh, you know, that was a good experience, maybe 17 years there. Wow. And uh, I worked with all kinds of publishers to repackage books for uh, the Guidepost audience. Basically, it's a business that was set up where, um, you have this magazine that generates all these names on a mailing list. So then it's like a built-in audience that you can then send mailing pieces to and say, Hey, we love this book. We think you will too. Um, it's a really important business for that company. Um, big business, well-known in the publishing industry. And I, and it introduced me to all the different publishers out there. Mm. And then around 2013, um, Zondervan publishing in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where I am now, um, is, you know, came seeking to see if I'd be interested in being their nonfiction publisher. Uh, so I went from being kind of a repackager and editor of devotionals and story collections to, um, and fiction to, um, uh, you know, working with a big, big budget publishing program, um, you know, pretty well-known author personalities um, literary agents, big offers, and and really just seeing how the publishing business has changed, and um, all the while kind of keeping a thread too to 
to my background and who I am as a person, you know, we all bring, we all bring who we are to our work. And, um, you know, I always thought that, you know, I could use some of my higher learning and to give me a sense of perspective on what I do to inform what I do. And I think if you talk to some of the people that I've worked with over the past, they'll be like, yeah, that David Morris. Yeah. He thinks a little bit too much, but he's really (laughs) smart. (laughs) <laughs> I believe that. No I don't know how smart I am, but I mean, you know, definitely think too much. <laughs> so now you've got your own businesses, which is great. Uh, Lake Drive Books, you know, which is a publishing house, and Eponymous Consulting, which is more of a literary agency. Can you right. tell folks about those? Right. Well, somewhere along the line, as I started out on my own, um, I I uh, realized I really wanted to work with uh people who are in that growing world of uh, those who are disaffected from their faith, disillusioned, disenfranchised. Um, you know, oftentimes today they're described as the nuns, meaning N-O-N-E-S. They're not, they, they say they don't have a religious affiliation, um, you know, or, or a, a popular word right now too is they're going through faith deconstruction. Well, that's something I've actually studied since I was in <laughs> grad school. It was wow. something... I felt, you know, and whether it's something that you feel very acutely or whether it's something broader, we, a lot of us are going through that just because of the world that we're in, you know, you have science and you have religion and you have pluralism and, you know, you mixing of cultures and you have mobility and it's, you know, it's not easy to stay connected to a faith community. I, you know, anybody I might meet or we might meet, you ask them, are you still in the same faith denomination you were when you grew up and a lot of people say no i'm not either they've switched or they're just not doing it anymore um so so i really try to focus on books for people who are somewhere in that process um and it's you know it's it's not as organized of a market it's not part of a big church denomination because church is about church um so i'm i've i've decided to just kind of you know work small stay small perhaps um, for authors who really warrant a larger book deal, I'll do agenting. Um, for those who are maybe starting out a little bit more and I see potential for them to get there, I'll do publishing. But it's really the same. It's the same audience I'm trying to work with. Cool. Just however best way that I can. Sure. Uh, and and I and I you know I feel like I've got all that publishing experience, so I'm trying to bring those skills to bear. And the thing about the world that we live in today it doesn't you know it's it doesn't matter your color your skin, you know, your, your creed, your gender, your sexuality. If you can, if you can really work this digital uh, platform environment that we're in, you know, the gatekeepers just aren't there like they used to be. And there's, there's opportunity for change and for growth, I think, socially, spiritually. And, and that's what I'm about. I mean, it's, it's exciting, you know, to see, you know, you be able to do this work and, you know, I think it's a really great fit for you thank you Um, yeah but you know let's talk about the platform thing for a minute just because you know that's just such an overwhelmingly important area for people for authors to be able to excel in or to need to excel in um you know what are your thoughts about how they can accomplish that in today's difficult you know platform building environment yeah, I, th- I think it's a lot of it is about changing our expectations about what we think publishing is. Mm. Um, if you feel like publishing is uh, something where you're going to write a book, it's very important. It's this powerful artifact. It's, a, it's, a, it's an immersive reading experience. Um, and you feel like everybody's got to read it. Well, that's the wrong idea. But if you are staying small and entrepreneurial and and you get really dialed in to your following, you have an opportunity in today's digital marketplace with, with, you know, websites and, you know, email lists and social media, and maybe even online events of some kind like podcasts um, or webinars. You have an odd, you have an opportunity to connect with people that may, that maybe you couldn't before in the kind of institutional structures we've had. Um, and, and it can be really gratifying. I'm seeing, um, you know, you're connect instead of connecting with 10,000 readers that you, you don't know, it's great. And maybe it's a bigger paycheck. Well, trust me, it's never as good as you might think it is. Um, <laughs> but, but that's not why you're in it all, totally. And, and it can, it can work better over time. 
But instead of 10,000 readers you don't know, what about, what about 1,500 that you do know really well? And, and then if your book is meant to go out broader, then those 1,500 will be good evangelists for your book and it will, it will, it will grow. Um, so I think there's something very authentic. We have an opportunity to be more authentic about our identities and who we are um, as, as authors and as people. And it, I, I just, I'm pretty optimistic about just the goodness that can come from that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally agree. Totally agree. It's a new world, brave new world. <laughs> yeah. So let's get into your new book. As I mentioned, the title is Lost Faith and Wandering Souls, The Psychology of Disillusionment, Mourning, and the Return of Hope. Yeah. So what led you to write a book about that? Yeah, I mean, I would just start with my personal story. I, you know, I, I felt a lot of dislocation myself. I mean, that's probably a really good word for me. I mean, I grew up, I, I was born in Indiana, grew up in Southern California, Northern Virginia, I spent a lot of my adult life in New Jersey, actually. Um, and, you know, a lot of that moving around just, just disrupted a sense of community for me. And particularly in Southern California, I was dialed in with ex extended family. I went to a, a Christian school, private Christian school. It was a part of a church, part of a denomination. And, um, you know, breaking out of that, going to Northern Virginia where, you know, Washington DC area where there's, you know, there's some Southern Baptists there, but it's not the same thing. Um, and, uh, um, not that, not that I was Southern Baptist before, but it's just it was just it's just mixing things up. Our our denomination didn't exist in northern in Northern Virginia, so it was a Baptist church that we went to. And I think I think it's just that kind of dislocation for a lot of us has um, it just it just disrupts the flow of of the sacred symbols that we use to sort of understand our life, to build our world view, world view, um, to organize who we are, and to shape our identity. So I think just generally that's sort of that's sort of what philosophers might call ex existential angst. I mean, it just it just happens to some extent. Um, so, you know, when I was in college, I, you know, I started studying some really cool stuff. It was very exhilarating, um, psychologically, philosophically, uh, biblical studies in religion, and um, it 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 just kind of opened my mind and made me start thinking more and. Um, trying to understand that process. And I was in a pretty high committed evangelical world, like a lot of us are or have been um, in varying degrees. And, um, you know, I wanted to try to make sense of it. So that, that's what I kind of went to grad school and to, to study psychology more intentionally. And uh, it really helped me put the language hmm. to my background. Um, and yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of it. Um, hmm. Hmm. Well, what would you say is like yeah. the, the central idea of the book? Sure, sure. Um, well, let's see. Um, I think I think I need to draw a little bit of context to that too. I think that um, uh, one of the key things to understand is I, you know, to take a psychological approach to faith is. Um, is to sort of see it from a more analytical point of view. So it's not a theological conversation. Let's just take that off the table. Let's not, let's not ignore it, but let's just set it aside for the moment and talk about faith from a, a sociological point of view, perhaps, a historical point of view, perhaps, or in my case, a psychological point of view. Um, so so I, that's kind of what I try to do. And, and I try to look at what is the experience, the inner experience of faith, not just in general, but for where we are located in the United States today. Um, so, um, you know, I look at things like, uh, you know, we're a, we're a very religious country. You know, that's how we got started with people seeking religious freedom coming over from Europe. Um, we have, uh, you know, the, the amendment in the Constitution that says government won't interfere with religion. So there's like a free market of religion in the United States. We have a strong sense of individualism. Um, so what does all that stuff mean and how does it affect the way that we relate to our faith? When you think about how uh, psychologically we are meaning seeking human beings. Um, so. So. So as I, you know, as I dig into this content, I start realizing things that, well, like faith, the word faith is different than religion. Faith is like our basic sense of trust as human beings. 
uh, assurance that everything's okay, that everything's going in a good direction, that we love and we have compassion for each other. And religion is sort of the sacred symbols that we create. It's the structure for faith. And that's very freeing. That was very freeing for me personally to be able to talk about faith in that way. And it starts to give you clues as to, you know, what does a healthy faith look like? Or what does an unhealthy faith look like? And, I, and, and all of us could probably name examples where we see, we see both. Uh, so, so getting to the central idea of the book is that um, basically a lot of us lose our faith uh, for one reason or another. And, um, you know, why does that, why does that happen? Um, and what do we do to get through that experience? Um, so I, I basically dive into some uh, psychological theorists after kind of setting the landscape like I did just a moment ago. Um, and I particularly focus on psychoanalysis, um, which is in, in this case, it's, it's Sigmund Freud. You know, it's some of his, his um, theory about mourning, about how, what, we, what we go through when we deal with loss. And then a couple of other uh, object relations theorists that they're known of, uh, Melanie Klein, also an Austrian uh, psychoanalyst, and then a British psychoanalyst named D.W. Winnicott. But let's just stick with like this idea of mourning. I won't get too heavy, too deep into the theory part. Um, I'm a little rusty probably, but because <laughs> I do publishing most of the time, but this stuff is so important to me. Um, basically, the, the idea is, and what I propose in the book is that, you know, what if, what if we looked at our faith loss as something that we're mourning, you know, how, you know, something that we're feeling sad about, maybe even angry about what is, what are the dynamics of mourning that can uh, lead us hopefully forward to understand that loss, to acknowledge that loss. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why we're in some of the trouble we're in right now is because a lot of us are just struggling with being able to do that. Uh, Freud in particular differentiates between mourning and melancholia. Healthy mourning is when you, you feel the sadness, maybe even get a little bit of angry, angry about it, Maybe there's even a little bit of denial in there, like Kubler-Ross talked about this with regard to mourning. Um, but eventually all that energy and that feeling of that sadness, you go and you find other place, other people and other things to invest yourself into. And you, and you begin to see a brighter world. You, can, you begin to feel love again, you know, eventually over time. Whereas in melancholia, you tend to, interject those feelings onto yourself. You, you maybe even unconsciously blame yourself for the loss. Uh, you, you, you stay angry. You refuse to, you deny and you refuse that a loss ever happened. And psychologically speaking, psychoanalytically speaking, uh, Freud calls that the ideal object. You create this object in your head of here's the way things are supposed to be. And, and you tend to rage and, and, and get angry um, and, you know, you might even pick on some people uh, and, and that leads you to, um, you know, just continuing to deny this, this loss. So, I, I mean, that's how I even look at things politically right now in this very contentious time right now. We have a lot of acting out going on. There's a lot of heresy hunting going on in the religious space. I don't know if you've noticed that, but, you know, if, if someone writes a historical book about you know, a lot of masculinity going on in evangelical Christianity, and it's strictly a historical survey, that author is getting accused for um, attacking God, for making theological statements. And it's like, that's not, that's not what she's doing. And it's, oh my goodness, it's just like, wh why are you so angry about this person who writes this really fascinating book that's just very illuminating? Um, well, it's threatening to their identity, it's threatening to their beliefs, right. you know, I mean, it's threatening to their whole internal or external system, you know, and so people right. don't can be threatened about things like that, uh, particularly when they're entrenched in such a world of their own certainty. Right. <laughs> but my, and my argument is that it's a psychological response that's sure. happening. Absolutely. Here. Absolutely. It, it's not, and it is about power and it is about politics and it is about race and it is about sexuality and it is about women. No question. But it is a psychological response. And, and I'm sorry. No, I said yeah, no question. No question. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, and if we, and part of what's so cool about uh, you know my studies in psychoanalysis, psychoanalytic theory, is it's about making the unconscious conscious. Hmm. There's so many, there's so many experiences and ideas. This is what, in one sense, this is kind of what a lot of the conversation about trauma is about right now. There, there is so much experience in your nervous system, in your body uh, from growing up. It's like a multitude of experience. That's why human beings are so mysterious and beautiful too. I don't, you know, I, I actually found God in psychology. Hmm. When you study human beings, you start to realize how wonderful and amazing they are and how many things influence their lives history personal temperament family upbringing local culture it's to to really understand someone is a big job and and because they're a beautiful thing uh so i kind of lost my i kind of lost my train of thought oh yeah so if you bring you know so there's so much memory there and when you lose right i mean you know, it's not conscious, as you said, and you bring it out, yeah. you become conscious is I think what you're getting at. Yeah. I think and it's you, important, and, really important. Right, right. And when, when you lose, when you lose something like a faith, that's like losing an ideal. And it's almost harder to mourn that than it is. Hmm. In one sense, it's harder to mourn that is than it is to mourn someone close to you that you lose or like a real person. When you, when you lose a faith community, you lose all these relationships, you lose a sense of identity. Mm-hmm. Freud called it a very morning, a very painstaking process. Hmm. And so I'm, I'm one of the people who say, you know, hold that and, and lean into it. Um, you know, you got to create a safe space. You got to create distance from it, but it is a part of who you are. I'm reading a book right now by an author that I'm considering for my imprint um, who went through a lot of uh, uh, sexual trauma and, hmm that's with you for life and it shapes and it shapes who you are. Um, now, you know, religion is, is a different bag, but um, you know, it, it, um, it, to just deny that that ever happened is not going to help this person. And it's not going to help you mm-hmm. if you're, if you can't see that, you know, Hey, I don't, you know, I don't go to church as much as I used to, or I don't, I don't connect with those people the way that I used to. You know, what's going on? How do I find community? That's one of the biggest questions that's going on right now, I think, among the disenfranchised hmm. is where do I now find community? Mm-hmm. I feel so alone. There's a lot that you hear that you hear that phrase quite a bit. Um, and I'm just trying to, you know, with the book, um, trying to bring in just this sense of pay attention to those feelings, pay attention to what's going on. Hmm. Wow. So what would you say would be like the single most helpful thing you discovered in your work that can help people find hope and move forward beyond the disillusionment and and unconnectedness? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think uh, some of the things that I noticed in my book, as I studied, what I did is I put a few spiritual memoirs on the couch, you know, Uh, we were just talking about Diana Butler Bass. I don't know if you noticed, but she's in there as well. And this is, you know, this was years ago when I was, you know, when I first started working on this and I worked on her memoir, Strength for the Journey, which is really good. I highly recommend it um, and her other books too. Um, but I, you know, I, I kind of discovered, first off, it takes a long time and people write books about this. I have a whole collection of spiritual memoirs. I'm losing faith and there's still more coming out. <laughs> um, and so people need to write about it. You need to tell your story. You need to talk about it because it, that's part of the mourning process. Um and I think mainly the number one thing is to is to is to not deny what happened, um, to feel that sadness, to lean into that anger. There's a lot of people who want to dismiss this conversation and dismiss those feelings. Um, I'm working with another author right now. She uh, she has a book coming out on uh, on the grief process. Actually, she's a bereavement counselor, mm. and uh, her book is titled uh, faith doesn't erase grief you know don't let religious people tell you you can't grieve Um, especially if what you're doing is mourning a faith community that you no longer belong to Mm -hmm. Um, feel feel some of that difficult stuff be try to hold gently your sense of disconnection Um, because in that you're going to you're going to then as you acknowledge it, it will then help you turn your face towards something that you can reconnect with. 
in a new way. But if you're just hiding, if you're angry, or if you're afraid, um, you won't you won't be able to go through that psychological journey. Is kind of what I'm saying. Yeah, Does that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, kind of stepping back a little bit on a broader perspective, you know, from a psychological perspective, where do you see religion headed in the United States? Yeah, I. I, you know, I, I think about this a lot. I even think about it as maybe another book topic. Um, but I, you know, this is going to sound a little strange to some, but I kind of, sometimes I kind of wonder if we just need to be less religious in the United States, like g- give yourself a break, <laughs> give yourself a break. Uh, you know, I, I was in a small group Bible study, like you, like a lot of us have been one time or another or still are. And, um, you know, I, ha- you know, I can take sometimes a little bit of a uh, of a biblical studies sort of you know very analytical approach to uh, sacred scripture. It's a historical document as much as it is a document of faith. It's both, but and it's very rich as a historical document. There's a lot to uncover there. It's really fascinating. Textual criticism is amazing. Um, but uh, this this person, um, you know, kind of express some thoughts about this. And, and then someone told me, well, you know, we were always taught that what this means, what this passage means is X, Y, and Z. And I was just like, you know, okay, but you just totally miss where I'm trying to say here and <laughs> where I'm coming from. And, and it just after a while, I, I kind of thought, you know, you know, what would be very healthful, healthy for that person? Just, just stop, stop reading the Bible for a year. See what happens. <laughs> See what happens if you, if you did that for a year. It, it might actually open your eyes to a lot of things. Mm-hmm. I, I will say that, you know, I've, you know, m- you know, my wife and I, uh, since the pandemic hit, we haven't gone back to church and we're not sure we want to go back to where we were. And we're still kind of figuring that out. And I haven't been as up on my Bible reading, but when I do open the Bible, I'm like, wow, I'm seeing things now that I've kind of like distanced myself from a lot of the, a lot of the, you know, uh, assumptions built around how you're supposed to understand your sacred symbols, I'm seeing, I'm seeing, I'm enjoying the reading of the Bible more hmm. because I take a, I took a break. That's very cool. Um, I forgot the, oh yeah. So how, where is, where is religion going? I, I think that's, to me, that's what I think about is, you know, there's this worry that we're going to become secular like Europe, but I, I, I wonder if that's, there's, there's a lot of layers to that worry, I think. Um, and you know, one of the one of the things that folks in Europe have, by and large, they've got like the weight of history there. They, you know, they, they can go walking through a town, and the buildings are like hundreds of years old, if not millennia. We're a much more individualistic, you know, lack of commu- community and cohesion. I heard I'm I'm planning a trip to to Europe, and uh, I'm just studying up on my German. And uh, someone mentioned it was a YouTube video, learned about it, language, right? And uh, they mentioned how um, in Germany on Sundays, you're really not supposed to do any work. Hmm. And it's not a religious thing necessarily. It's more of a, a worker's rights kind of thing. Hmm. It's just this culture of rest, mm-hmm. but it's not, it's not overlaid with a lot of religious verbiage. Maybe some of it's in there, but, and I just said, that's really fascinating. You know, why don't we have that approach in America? Uh, and I, I just wonder sometimes if, if we can still be Christian or whatever faith might be and not be as, um, you know, not, not be as so tightly wound around it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and maybe if that was the case, there'd be more compassion. There'd be more community. Um, there'd be more, um, you know, help for the poor. Uh, there'd be less isolation and less loneliness. Um, I I think those things are connected. Absolutely, and I'm, ponder, I'm pondering it, and I'm wondering. No, totally, totally. And I do, different. and obviously too, we're more pluralistic in the United States. You know, we can't have this one, you know, sort of ideal American way. It's it's many different ways, and we we've got we've got some challenges in this country that are very very real, and. Um, it, it's just, it's not going to go away and we have to keep working at it. Absolutely. Wow. So, you know, you've got the new book, you've got a literary agency business, a publishing house. So um, 
Is that going to keep you busy? Those those things for a while, or you got anything new that you're going to launch that you want to talk about? Or no, no, that's that that is it. Um, you know, thank thank you. Um, I I would encourage people to go check out uh, the uh, the imprint. It's called Lake Drive Books. It's at lakedrivebooks.com, and I say that because there's some amazing authors there. I've signed I've signed six authors, a couple more on the way. I'm I, I'm including my book in there. It was I didn't want to practice on uh, on my authors, so I'm practicing on myself <laughs> um, and uh, learning a lot of things. You know, I have a lot of publishing experience, but I'm learning a ton right now, and I am very very busy, and I, and I'm definitely trying to help um, agent authors who are in this space, but who who really have bigger platforms and and can create impact. I want to help them do that. Uh, but yeah, follow the authors that are on lakedrivebooks.com. There's some really cool stuff coming there. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's kind of what it's about right now too, is to help create community and networks of support for each other, mm-hmm. um, especially as writers and authors. You know, you guys can be, you know, th- those folks can be like the best advocates for each other. And um, yeah, that's it's it's exciting. It's exciting work. I've had people reach out to me about the imprint. Like, how can I work with you? This is good, awesome, good. and I, that's so gratifying. Yeah, I, I was just remarking to a colleague this morning. I need to find more authors, <laughs> so I can get more freelancers involved. And you know, but it takes it takes wherewithal. It takes book sales. It takes dollars. You can't have ministry without money and that kind of thing. So I'm I'm building it from the ground up ground up it and time. it's yeah. it's very exciting yeah it, it takes time to build the momentum and build awareness of things like what you're doing so you know it's not an overnight thing it's a slog it's a long you know journey. yeah thank so, you you would know you would know i appreciate that yeah. well i mean that's the way I've, i felt you know in, in what i've done so far you know it's 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 a marathon it's not a sprint yeah yeah well said so again, uh, Lake Drive Books, Eponymous Consulting, and the new book is Lost Faith and Wandering Souls. You can learn about all of that at davidrmorris.me. So David, thanks again for joining us. Um, stay in touch. Let us know how things go. Thanks so much, Brian. I really appreciate it. Take care.